chance to introduce you to the people. So Raquel got his degree in chemistry in Cuba, Havana, and then she moved to, I mean, a kind of uh, what we call sanduíche doutorado here in Brazil, between Havana and uh, Spain, and she got her PhD degree in 2010. And from 2010, uh, let me just select my point. And from 2010 to 2013, she was with uh, Mario Barbati, our friend, for a postdoc period. And after that, she went to UK, and where she has been since 2013. And since 2015, she is at the chemistry department at the Queen Mary University of London. And nowadays, she is a senior lecturer in the same uh, university. She's also director of the chemical research. And among her research interests, I highlight the excited states, non adiabatic dynamic simulations, modeling of chemical reactions in the ground and excited states, and from molecule to the, to the solid. I think she, that's the topic of this uh, seminar today. And she always involved in developing softwares. And she is author of Newton X, a well-known program for chemical, for dynamics, excited state dynamics. And she also co-author of uh, Fromage, or she's the, the main author of Fromage. I think she's going to show us some results with this program. And just a few numbers. According to Web of Science, she has around 70 publications. And remember, she got her PhD in 2010, so a very young researcher. An index age 21 and around 1,500 uh, citations. So it's a great pleasure to me and to us to listen to you today. So during the, the seminar, please keep your microphone mute and questions at the end. I think it's it's better in this way. And I'm sure everybody will enjoy your seminar very much, Raquel. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much. Thank you very I'm much. Just to close my presentation yes. and, you, and you can start yours. Let me start. A window, yes. Okay, okay, Antonio, thank you very much for the very nice presentation. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to present what we've been doing the last uh, a few years. That has uh, it's been related with modeling excited states in molecular crystals. Um, our motivation. Uh, to uh, look at these particular problems uh, comes from the many applications that highly emissive materials have. Uh, and we can think about uh, some cases like uh, organic diodes, uh, if we think about OLEDs, for example, if we think about uh, fluorescent bioproof, or if we think about organic lasers, in particular, uh, organic uh, uh, um, lasers made of uh, aromatic compounds, uh, we can uh, you can see that for any of these applications, you need to be able to design and you need to be able to optimize systems, molecular systems that are highly emissive. Um, one feature of this kind of applications is like, we need to move from the gas phase to the uh, a solid state in many cases. So we are working in the condensed phase and that brings uh, some problems when we think about the way of describing this from the computational point of view. So we've been working on uh, developing some techniques and some tools to analyze excited states when we move to uh, the condensed phase, in particular in the case of organic molecular crystals. Uh, the advantage of uh, working with organic molecular crystals is like we are able to uh, 
uh, identify and characterize the crystal structures very well. In general, we try to work with systems that has been uh, experimentally characterized. So we have like the three-dimensional structure of them. And uh, as you know, organic molecular crystals are stabilized but weak intermolecular forces. So in principle, we have a system where we have a set of molecules uh, interacting uh, in a, a, an infinite crystal. At, at least we can assume uh, that it's an infinite crystal and that uh, these interactions uh, in most of the cases are weak. So the perturbation that we have to our uh, excited states are not going to be that important. And for many of the cases, they are not that important. So we can try to play a little bit with the methods that we already have. I want to work uh, to talk a little bit more about uh, how to move from the different uh, phases here and uh, what is the effect of considering different uh, molecules and to consider also the periodicity of the crystal for the description of the systems. But uh, essentially, we are uh, assuming in most of the cases that uh, our uh, uh, environment uh, doesn't affect the uh, localized excitations that much. So um, let's think about, uh, let's talk about uh, the optimization of highly emissive crystals. And uh, when we think about it again, uh, as I mentioned before, our interest on this comes from the applications that are related to uh, this kind of systems. And we need to think about what happens when you move from solution or from gas phase to the condensed phase. And essentially, we have that in most of the cases, we will, ha we will have quenching of emission. Uh, quenching comes in many cases because of the stabilization of charge transfer complexes, for example, where you can have uh, some decay through conical intersections. And uh, in many cases, it also comes from the stabilization of uh, pipe pack interactions or if we think about another possible pathway, you, we can also think about the possibility of having overlap between the vibrational uh, 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 nuclear wave functions. Uh, either for one mechanism or the other, uh, it's very common that when you move from the con uh, to the condensed phase, you will have a quenching of the emission. In terms of the quantum yields, that translates to uh, either a decrease in the radiative uh, decay rates or an increase in the no radiative decay uh, rates. So our aim here is try to think uh, about how to be able to increase the quantum yields and uh, uh, to focus on this kind of systems. Uh, we've been looking at systems that show aggregation induced emission. Uh, what is aggregation induced emission? Essentially, aggregation induced emission is the process where when you move to the condensed phase, instead of getting a, a decrease in the quantum yield, you have an increase in the quantum yield. And uh, the reason for getting uh, this uh, 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 enhance quantum yield when you move to the solid state for this kind of systems is essentially because you are not able to decay to the ground state through the mechanisms that I mentioned before. So um, it may happen that uh, you are uh, because of the constraints that you have in the crystal structure that you are blocking the access to a conical intersection. Uh, it could also happen that you are uh, 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 restricting the vibrations of your system that in one way can help to uh, uh, stop the decay through conical intersections and also could restrict the intermolecular, intramolecular uh, motions that can take also the system to the ground state because of the overlap overlap of the nuclear wave function. So if we think about the fermi golden rule and we look at the non-radiative decay equation, you know that we have like two components. Uh, essentially, one comes from the uh, nuclear part and the other uh, one uh, comes from the electronic part. And then we need to play with these two uh, components. Um, in terms of the uh, quantum yields, uh, you will see that uh, even when uh, the quantum yield uh, depends on radiative and non-radiative decay, you will be you will see that in most of the cases, the increase uh, in the quantum yield in this kind of systems will come essentially uh, because of the uh, uh, decrease in the non-radiative decay rate. So um, we all, always try to have an idea of both possibilities of the uh, uh, radiative mechanisms and non-radiative mechanisms, but uh, you will see that in most of the cases, the differences that you have 
uh, in aggregate, aggregation induced emission uh, systems, like essentially what you have when you move to the condensed phase is a decrease in the uh, non radiative decay rate. So, uh, thinking about these two uh, extreme cases, to tell it somehow, one case where uh, we are thinking about the contribution of the electronic part in this equation, that means like we may have like um, a, a restriction of the access to conical intersections that would be related mostly to the a coupling between the electronic wave function and the nuclear uh, vibrations. So in that case, the model that has been used to explain this kind of processes has been proposed by uh, Blanca Ford in 2013, and it's called restricted access to the conical intersection. And essentially what that mo the model says is like, when you move to the solid state, what's gonna happen is like the, uh, 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 a pathway that takes the system to the ground state through a conical intersection is restricted because you have a most likely some kind of a, 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 a sterical a, a restriction that doesn't allow to, a, the system to decay. And the other model, and this is the model that has been mainly used uh, uh, in the literature, uh, is the, the, the model uh, proposed by uh, um, uh, Tan and Shui that uh, is a uh, called restriction of intramolecular motion. So essentially what it says is like when you go to the solid state, uh, you restrict the overlap between the nuclear wave functions. So uh, either because one thing, uh, one thing or the other, you will uh, be able for this kind of systems to uh, increase the quantum yield in the solid state. So our main interest uh, has been on uh, looking at different crystals where you know that uh, uh, these crystals show aggregation induced emission. I'm trying to understand what makes the, the systems different uh, to uh, those who show uh, quenching, okay? So uh, before I start in describing the kind of uh, systems that we've been working at and the method that we've been uh, working with, um, I would like to talk a little bit about some features uh, that are related to aggregation that we need to take into account when we are moving to the condensed phase. Uh, first, um, as I mentioned uh, initially, um, we try to keep as much as possible uh, working with uh, methods that uh, we can uh, uh, define also for the gas phase. But we need to take into account different uh, things here. For example, we need to consider what happens when, you, when we have aggregation. And uh, you know that uh, when you have uh, when you form a dimer, depend, uh, uh, depending on the orientation of the transition dipole moments, uh, you may have like the, uh, if we consider the Kasha exiton model, you may have like the uh, emission uh, would be uh, uh, forbidden in the particular case when we are talking about a uh, H aggregates where you have this kind of configurations for the transition dipole moments, or we can have like the uh, oscillator strength of the mission uh, is supposed to be twice the oscillator strength of the uh, isolated uh, molecules. Uh, when we look at this model, Kasha model uh, is based essentially on considered electrostatic interaction between the, between the molecules. And uh, it's a reduced model based on perturbation and theory uh, but it's very useful in many cases. However, it doesn't consider uh, the uh, possibility of your system to uh, be affected by the whole environment, by the um, um, interactions with the repeated uh, units in the solid. It doesn't consider either that uh, when you have this kind of mechanisms and these effects will affect essentially radiative decay, doesn't say anything of what is going to happen with no radiative decay. So you can perfectly have a, a very well behaved H dimer that uh, because of the, uh, um, sorry, very well behaved J, uh, J dimer where the right configuration of the transition dipole moments where you don't have a emission. And the reason for that could be that essentially no radiative decay could be a, 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 a just very effective in this kind of a, a intermolecular complexes. So it's not that, I mean, the, the analysis should always take into account not only 
the configuration of the transition dipole moments, but you also need to take into account the uh, environment and the effect of the environment on the excited states, and you also need to take into account with what happens with the non-radiative decay mechanism. So, um, looking at the methods that we normally use, and we try to use this method when we move to the solid as well, we normally try to use multi-reference methods, single reference methods as well. To the T, we know the problems that they have to describe conical intersections and so on, but sometimes they help us to uh, describe a stable uh, um, um, structures in the potential energy surfaces, like uh, um, the structure of the uh, S1 minima and, uh, and a structure of T1 minima that are uh, very helpful and sometimes very well described with TDFT. So in general, we use a combination of methods here to deal with the excited states. We use uh, also CASA CF and CASP2 to deal with crossings with the with the uh, ground state, and essentially we use a combination of methods. Okay, so um, let's try to put all these methods in the context of the solid and. Uh, how, what do we do? Because, okay, we have our uh, excitations that, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, in the case of molecular uh, uh, crystals, they are mostly localized. Uh, and um, if you look at the, uh, if you do, do like a extended calculation of your system, you will see that in general, your excitation is going to be localizing one, two, uh, molecules in most of the cases, even when you consider many of them. So uh, the use of uh, localized uh, methods like QMMN and QMMN embedding uh, methods uh, ha uh, has a lot of advantages for the description of the uh, solid state uh, systems and for the excitations in molecular crystals. Uh, one problem that we have that uh, when we uh, use uh, this kind of localized methods is like, uh, in general, what people do is like they extract from the crystal a cluster, a cluster that is uh, uh, obtained by truncating the crystal and using just a, a set of molecules around the central region. Um, this can work in many cases, but you are uh, uh, not taking into account that uh, this uh, excitation happens in a periodic system and that you may have some long-range electrostatic interactions that may be affected in a way or, of, or another the uh, localized excitation. So uh, while working with the whole periodic description could be too expensive and in some in some cases not even very good because uh, the excitations are going to be clearly localized it's good to have some uh, effect included in your methods that take into account the interaction with the long-range periodic images that you have in your solid so to deal with this we've been working with a, a, a method a qmmn technique that consider the uh, electrostatic interaction with this uh, long range uh, 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 molecules uh, molecules that you have at the long range and to do that we use uh, you know about the eval summation technique that is normally used to uh, calculate long range electrostatic interactions uh, and um, the methods based essentially in splitting the uh, uh, calculation of the electrostatic potential in two terms, one for the real space and another for the reciprocal space. This is extremely helpful because when we are working with a periodic system, if you try to calculate the exact electrostatic interactions, you may have problems with convergence and uh, the convergence uh, depends on the order that you do the summation. So, and on the other hand, they converge very, very slowly. So doing this kind of separation is extremely useful and uh, it allows you to uh, simplify in a way the description of long range interaction. So uh, what we've, we have been doing is working with a, an, eval, a, 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 an embedding method based on a, this, a, the use of this eval summation a, a technique. So essentially what we do is like we uh, use periodic boundary condition methods to optimize the crystal structure, the periodic structure, and from this we obtain the electrostatic potential of the system. Then we select um, a cluster in, the, uh, in our crystal, but uh, around this cluster we choose a region uh, of charges that can be changed 
to reproduce the electrostatic potential of the whole crystal. So in this way, we combine in a way the localized description of the excitation in a region of the crystal. And at the same time, we consider the effect of the interaction with the long range uh, uh, um, uh, charges that you have in the crystal. I mean, in practical terms, this is done by uh, uh, choosing a cluster uh, and choosing three regions in the cluster. In the central region, you have like, uh, where, uh, is the region where the excitation happens, uh, is what we call a uh, song one. And around this region, we select another region with uh, six charges. And we use the charges for that region that are obtained from quantum chemical calculations. You don't, we don't change these charges. While uh, for the cell region, uh, we let the charges change to uh, reproduce the electrostatic potential of the whole crystal. In that way, and if we select uh, properly the number of charges that you use in the, in the calculation, you are able to modify the charges of this region in a way that they will be able to provide a description of the whole periodic system. Uh, when you look at this kind of method, this kind of method has been used in the past quite a lot to deal with defects in ionic crystals and also to calculate NMR properties in molecular crystals. They're used to uh, calculating uh, excited states uh, uh, has been uh, um, only, I mean, has, has started very recently. And, uh, um, we, uh, I mean, we uh, we were uh, we took as a reference the work by the Siofinis group. Uh, they uh, work with these methods and they use it for a, a set of molecular crystals. Uh, uh, they did it uh, using a, um, a set of point charges that were not uh, uh, changed or the, uh, using different techniques, and we tried to, in a way. Uh, optimize the method uh, in a way that could take into account not only the long range interactions, but also some components from dispersion at the shorter, a shorter range. So um, what we've done is to define uh, an evil embed embedded cluster, uh, cluster method uh, where we use this evil embedding. Embedding this method is based on onion in a way because it considers calculations uh, 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 and you, you just uh, try to uh, compensate some of the terms to obtain others. And uh, what we've done here uh, is to do a calculation of the excitation uh, of your main system surrounding, surrounded that by these point charges that I told you about. You have the buffer region, then you have like the uh, charges that you allow to modify to reproduce the electrostatic uh, potential of the system. And then you do a uh, two uh, other set of calculations where that will give you uh, the contribution of other uh, uh, components of the energies. With this, uh, with this calculation, we recover the uh, electrostatic interactions at the short and, uh, uh, and uh, long, uh, long uh, uh, distances. And with these calculations that we do at the ground state, we recover part of the uh, exchange and dispersion interaction, but these are assumed to be in the uh, ground state. Uh, so. Uh, defining the energy in this way, we can uh, define uh, gradients, we can uh, uh, optimize systems, we can even optimize conical intersections. The advantage of this method uh, 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 in comparison with the one that was used by Siofini and this before is like they only use uh, they, they used to uh, use only the uh, electrostatic part. So uh, if you don't add something else to the energy, the potential could be sometimes too repulsive or too attractive. And it's very difficult to optimize, for example, conical interceptions because uh, you may have like breaking bonds that are not uh, you can you can break bonds that are not necessarily correct. Uh, uh, for uh, describing your particular system. So we combine, combine all these components and we put this together and we uh, define this uh, embedded cluster, cluster technique. Um, there is something else that we can do here and it's to consider also the relaxation uh, that you get 
uh, of the external charges because of the interaction with the central uh, molecule. And to do that, we can use a, you can also define a self-consistent uh, uh, methods where um, you update the charges of the uh, molecules of the crystal considering the charges of the central uh, excited molecule. And do that, you can uh, uh, implement this in a self-consistent way and update the charges of the system in a way that they respond in a way to the excitation. So this is also possible and we also have implemented this. So uh, we have implemented these methods uh, in, a, in, a, in a program that is called Fromage that Antonio mentioned before. It has been mainly programmed by my PhD student, uh, uh, Miguel. He graduated uh, last year. We are still doing some work with other, uh, with other members of, of, of my group, refining the method and also defining some other approximations to improve this kind uh, of techniques. But essentially what is, in, uh, what is uh, available now in Framash uh, is these uh, uh, algorithms that are based, as I mentioned before, uh, on onion. And they consider like electrostatic embed this electrostatic embedding technique using the eval embedding. We can also have implemented this self-consistent uh, uh, method. And we can, with this, uh, optimize conical intersections, optimize minima in the excited states, and so on. And, it has, and this has the advantage that you consider, in a way, the effect of the environment or the crystal environment on the excitation on a central molecule. So um, this is, I mean, this is like an interface. I mean, we do the electronic uh, structural calculations using a popular electronic structural calculation like Gaussian, Molcas, a turbo mole. Uh, we have DFTV also for the calculation of the uh, uh, QM prime region. So there are different methods that are available and you can try if you're interested in. Uh, um, we have implemented this for TDFT, for CASCF, for CASPT2. So there are different choices that you can make in every case. So uh, in addition to these techniques, um, we have also implemented uh, some, uh, some tools uh, that uh, are uh, uh, optimized to do analysis of your uh, crystal. So I mean, when you are going to when you are going to uh, do this kind of calculations, as I mentioned at the beginning, normally you need to select a cluster in your system, and with uh, and you we have some tools to select clusters in your systems to calculate uh, different parameters that are relevant for the crystal, like boronoid volumes, uh, to generate different kind of clusters to select and to generate and detect dimers to uh, do uh, exciton analysis, to do exciton classification. So there are different tools there that can be useful for you. And maybe you can be interested in looking at that. So I recommend you, if you are interested in this kind of problems, to take a look at, uh, at Fromage. So um, now that I've described the main techniques that we use for analyzing this kind of problems, I'm going to show you some examples of the systems that we've been looking at. And the first case is the case of uh, propeller-shaped molecules. I mean, these systems are uh, examples of systems that show aggregation in this emission. And uh, we have a study a series of systems that show a very interesting behavior. Essentially, this kind of system show a structure where you have a central, a, a, a aromatic structure and you have some aromatic molecules attached. So you have a lot of vibrations here that if you are uh, in solution or in um, gas phase are going to take the system to the ground state. So essentially what we tried to analyze here was uh, to understand the different behavior that you can have uh, if you change the nature of the uh, uh, heteroatom here in the in the central region. And you can see that you have a silicon here with two met methyl groups attached. In this case, okay, it's not an heteroatom, it's a carbon. And in this case, we have sulfur. And you can see that for these two ca cases, you have a strong aggregation induced emission, essentially that means like uh, when you move from this to the solid state, uh, these systems don't emit in solution, essentially because you have no radiative decay facilitated by this, uh, uh, the rotations around these bonds. But when you move to the solid, you will have a brightly emi emitive system. And in this case, this system uh, show weak aggregation induced emission. So we tried to take a look at the differences between these systems and try to understand what was the reason behind that. Uh, when, you, when you move to the solid state, there is always a question. OK, the behavior that you see is because the excitation and the uh, localized 
uh, uh, nature of the excitation or it is related in a way with the three-dimensional system, a uh, uh, structure of the system. So we try to answer these kind of questions. First of all, uh, I want to tell you that when we look at the exciton couplings in that system and the exciton, set exciton couplings are related to the splitting on the energy levels that uh, uh, happens because of the formation of dimers when you are in condensed phase, you can see the exciton couplings are extremely small. And uh, these exciton couplings are uh, much smaller than the re reorganization energies that the energies uh, the systems gain because of the uh, of the uh, relaxation in the excited state. So it's expected that these excitations are going to be extremely localized on the uh, monomers. Now, um, when we look at the structures and we try to uh, analyze. Um, how much the vibrations will uh, contribute to, to contribute to the organization energies? You can see that uh, if you analyze the differences between vacuum and crystal, I'm going to uh, I'm not going to analyze the solution because it's a it's a it's 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 a, it's, it's a little bit in between. So. Uh, in the case when you move from the uh, vacuum to the crystal, you can see that you have like a really a, a, a decrease in the in the contribution of this. Uh, torsional modes to the reorganization energy. Essentially, when you move to the solid state, you will see like the system is more rigid. So something that you would you could expect. And of course, if you if we are thinking about the systems, you can see you can see that essentially what happens is like you will restrict these rotations. Now, what what's the interesting thing here that the, this is there are not main differences between the behavior of this, the three systems. All of them show this behavior. So even for this one that shows weak aggregation in this emission, you will see like these torsional modes are going to be restricted when you move to the crystal. So uh, what happens with no radiative decay? Uh, if we try to analyze what happens to no radiative decay here, and we just try to uh, optimize the conical intersections in your system and try to look at what happens at your potential energy surfaces, you will see that uh, when you are in, in, in gas phase, for example, you will have like a, a, an accessible conical intersection that is related to the pocketing of the central ring. You can see this is a very distorted structure. And when you optimize this in the crystal, you will see like the structure changes a little bit. This uh, a ring is going to move a little bit to be able to accommodate the interactions with the rest of the molecules in the system. And you will see that the conical intersection that was available or was accessible, classically accessible uh, in the vacuum is not accessible anymore. So that explains in a way why a TPC, that is the one with carbon, a, a, shows aggregation in this emission and if you look at the uh, uh, at the at the system with silicon you will see that the behavior is very is very similar so uh, what is the difference when you have you have sulfur if we look at sulfur and you know every time that you have sulfur you need to take into account that you may have some triple states in your system that could be uh, participating in the uh, excited state mechanism so uh, what you see is like uh, if you just do a plot of the energies of the different uh, uh, stationary structures in the in the excited state and we plot the uh, energies of the uh, conical intersections and also the crossings between the ground state and the uh, lowest energy triple you will see like uh, for this system with, sul with sulfur you will see like we have accessible conical intersections and we also have accessible crossings between singles and triples. What happens when you move to the crystal? When you move to the crystal, essentially what you have is like the a crossing that uh, the conical intersection that is related with the uh, in the uh, for this kind of systems is related to breaking of the carbon sulfur bond. This conical intersection is not accessible anymore. It's restricted because the presence of atoms in the environment of the system. However, the a, a crossing between the singles and the triple that shows a, a shorter intermolecular distance, this one is still accessible. So that could be a, one of the, the reasons why the um, 
the, this system show a completely different behavior. If we try to uh, do a more uh, detailed analysis of the energies and how they change with the uh, distances between the carbon and the sulfur, and we look at the spin orbit couplings, you can see that along this reaction coordinate, you will have a, you have a change in the nature of the uh, uh, excitations, and you will see that you significantly inc increase the spin orbit couplings when you increase the uh, uh, the distance between the carbon and the and the sulfur. So that's essentially supports the idea. You may have some uh, intersystem crossing here as one of the uh, uh, non radiative decay mechanisms. And if we take a look at this in the crystal, uh, even when the spin orbit couplings are a little bit smaller, that, that's still this possibility. So that seems to be the, the explanation of the difference in behavior between this kind of systems. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this is not a case where um, the interaction with the uh, molecules in the environment seem to be extremely important because the excitations are extremely localized. So uh, let's try to take a look at our cases where the interaction could be a little bit more important. And uh, in this case, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about systems that show intra in, uh, intramolecular proton transfer. And these systems are relevant because uh, they have many applications. I mean, they are inter interesting because of their large stock shift, and they show dual emission between the enol and the keto form. So essentially, when you excite these systems, you will have like the system can, uh, uh, can relax in the excited state either through a, a keto a, a, a pathway where the proton is transferred to the other side of the molecule, or the system can also relax uh, through the uh, regular enol uh, pathway where uh, the system uh, will just relax, relax, relax in the enol form. Um, we found in the literature a set of compounds that show very interesting behavior. I mean, the first uh, set of compounds are compounds related to hydrochalcon. And these hydrochalcon derivatives, uh, they are uh, um, they show quenching when they are in when they are in solution. So uh, what is interesting here, they are uh, some of these compounds are really emissive in the in the solid state, while others are not emissive. So uh, as they, their structures are really similar, uh, uh, the experimental people who publish this, uh, these papers, they uh, explain the difference in behavior using or considering the three-dimensional structures of the crystal. So we try to take a look at uh, the excited state mechanisms and try to explain why uh, this difference were, were observed by looking at the uh, uh, mechanisms and the non-radiative decay mechanisms here. So. Um, if you uh, have an hydrogen here and here, you will see that the system show a relatively decent uh, 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 quantum yield. Uh, if you just change uh, um, the uh, the hydrogen by a methyl group here or a methoxy group here, you will see like uh, you will have again like the quantum yield is very small. So uh, we try to explain. You can see also the behavior wh what happens when you have like fluorines and this. So we try to explain the behavior at the differences of behavior of these systems. We also, I mean, in the meantime, we found some systems where they had similar structures but they lack from one of the aromatic uh, groups here. So when you uh, uh, get rid of one of the aromatic groups in your system, what's going to happen is like the uh, quantum yield is going to increase quite a lot. So it may be related to the fact that you may have a, 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 some kind of pi pi interactions where you, you are in the solid for the system that don't appear in this uh, case, but as you will see later, this is not exactly the explanation for this. So um, what we did before anything was to look at the potential energy surfaces of the HC system, uh, the one with the extra aromatic ring. And when you look at the potential energy surface, you can clearly characterize two conical intersections uh, related to the decay of the system. So these conical intersections are, are associated with the rotation around this, this bond. And they will happen, uh, I mean, that they will appear if you have a proton transfer or, or if you don't have proton transfer. So uh, when you look at this uh, structure, in general, changing the groups don't make a big difference, but there is a little detail here. And uh, it's like, uh, for the cases where you have a methoxy group here or a methyl group, you will see that uh, the proton transfer is so uh, 
a, a, a favor that uh, you don't f you won't be able to find uh, the in all minima so most of the uh, uh, the pathway related to the uh, proton transfer is extremely likely and if you do not uh, not adiabatic dynamics here and we do we did it here doing surface open and you can see this clearly uh, when you analyze the uh, population of the different uh, relaxation pathways. And you can see that in the case of one, and one is the system where you have like uh, all hydrogens, you will see that the population splits uh, into relaxation uh, into the uh, keto uh, uh, pathway and the enol pathway. While when uh, for the system where you have uh, the metoxy group, uh, uh, that is not uh, uh, emissive in the uh, in the solid state. In this case, you will have a significant bias toward the uh, uh, excited state proton transfer channel. So there is a difference there that it could have something to do with what happens with the systems, and we are going to look at this a little bit later. So uh, after analyzing the mechanisms, uh, and we've done this with several levels of theory, I mean, we've been working with this system for a while, because they are, in a way, uh, they are for us like uh, a laboratory, because uh, there was very good experimental data for them, So it, and we had the crystal structure, so we could analyze a lot of uh, parameters and a lot of properties for this kind of system. So uh, we did uh, uh, we did uh, uh, analyze the crystal structures of the systems and uh, we tried to characterize the different kind of uh, uh, in, uh, motif that you can find in this kind of systems. And you can see that if we compare the different systems, essentially you will find that for the HP series, you will find that the T-shaped motif are extremely common. And you can find also that for the cases where you have a uh, a, a very low a phosphorescence. So there is not something that you can really directly correlate between the three-dimensional structure of the materials and the behavior that the, the photochemical behavior of, uh, of them. So in that case, we saw that we, it would be worth uh, looking at the uh, excited state mechanisms for the system, and it was what we did. So here I show you a table where we have like the uh, differences that we get if we use like um, a, an embedded cluster without a, a considering the long range interactions that we use that we do with the evil embedded a cluster and you can see that for absorption doesn't really a matter too much a, um, a you have i mean in terms of vacuum vacuum doesn't a, doesn't matter here because vacuum essentially what you see here is the redshift normal when you go to the to the solid state but you can see that in the case of emission the interaction with the long range a charges could be a little bit more difficult uh, to reproduce and in that case we found that in general if we want to reproduce properly the uh, wavelength related to emission we really need to uh, consider this long range interaction so uh, this is a benefit of, I've seen of using this kind of uh, evil embedding, uh, embedding techniques uh, for for uh, this kind of system. So uh, let's take a look at the uh, uh, radiative decay and non radiative decay for this kind of system because, as I mentioned at the beginning, you have like the a quantum GL depends on the radiative decay as well. So one possibility here is always okay maybe this system is emissive because radiative decay is more more effective when you are in the solid and essentially here we consider like the experimental quantum yields and calculated the radiative uh, decay just by integrating the uh, calculated uh, uh, absorption spectrum and uh, when you do that you can see uh, you can clearly see that there are not significant differences between the radiative decay rates but uh, what is uh, what changes between the system is the system is essentially the non radiative decay rate. So, I mean, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, it's very common that the explanation behind the different behavior in the solid state will come from analyzing non radiative decay mechanisms. Okay. So, what we did here uh, in the case of one and five, we tried to optimize the conical intersections in the solid. And to do that, uh, as we were not very sure at the beginning whether we will need to consider 
uh, dimer, so how important was the level of localization to describe the excited state. We did this uh, using monomers and we did it using dimers as well. So, um, and we get very similar descriptions in both cases. Essentially, what you see, what you see is, okay, if you look at the CASA CF geometries, uh, uh, when you are in the gas phase, you can see that you have this a kind of a uh, rotated geometries that when you try to obtain uh, the same conical intersections in the in the solid you don't obtain exactly this lowest energy conical intersection okay and that's essentially because you don't have the possibility of rotating these angles as much when you are in the solid. Uh, the conical intersection that you get is closer to another conical intersection that can also be found in the in vacuum and that is also accessible, but it's higher in energy than uh, this conical intersection here. And essentially, that's because of the restrictions that you have in the solid. So uh, if you optimize your conical intersections in the solids, you will find you will find that the rotation, I mean, you still have rotation, but you have a significant degree of pokering here. And uh, I would like to mention here that uh, the conical intersection that is associated with the uh, rotation in the inner form is not accessible. It's very high in energy. So a uh, proton transfer is extremely important here in terms of uh, uh, allowing the conical intersections to stabilize because proton transfer will allow to obtain a, 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 a system that can pyramidize and uh, can uh, provide like a lowest uh, way of go, uh, of uh, 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 giving you the crossing. So uh, once you plot that, and uh, again, we've done this with several level of le levels of theory, you can see that the main difference between the two systems, and I'm taking here like the two string cases, we, we, are, we are taking here the case where we have aggregation in this emission and the case where you don't have aggregation in this emission, you can see that in both cases, now the conical intersections that you obtain will be like a uh, higher in energy than the that the minima in the excited state and uh, if you compare that uh, with the gas phase this is different because in the gas phase you could see like everything was really downhill but here of course because of the restriction of the in the solids you will have an increase of the energy of the conical intersection because of the uh, restrict, restrictive rotation in the in the solid however you will see like in the case of one, provided the initial excitation energy, this uh, is classically accessible. You have a barrier, but still is accessible. In the case of five, it's not accessible. So if we try to analyze what is the reason for that difference in, in stabilization, you will see that it's really connected to uh, the uh, Coulombic interactions. And um, if you try, for example, to uh, describe this assistance just using mechanical embedding and forgetting about the uh, uh, um, electrostatic interactions, you will see that both conical intersections are not accessible. So what makes the difference here is to describe properly the Coulombic interactions in your system. So essentially what you have is like the short range electrostatic interaction will stabilize the uh, conical intersection in the case of five and it's the reason why it's uh, accessible and the reason what we seen uh, system five and the other system that uh, show uh, uh, that no, do, doesn't show brightly em em emission uh, in the solid state is essentially the accessibility of a conical intersection there. So uh, if we take a look at these systems and we try to analyze how the mechanism is, I mean, we can uh, think about an initial excitation that may involve a dimer then you have relaxation that in the solid it goes first to the enol form and then you will have a possibility of proton transfer and stabilization in the in the keto form and then you may have a, a, a conical intersection that could be accessible or not depending on the stabilization that you have provided the interaction with the environment. So essentially in the case of five and or system that doesn't show a brightly emissive state, essentially what you have is a, a accessible conical intersection. So what happens in the systems that uh, don't have this additional uh, aromatic group? Uh, in the case of the syst these systems that they are, as I show you at the beginning, they are really emissive and uh, 
Uh, when you look at them, their chronicle intersections are not accessible. So uh, our narrative uh, stays that more or less the same. So our question here was, OK, uh, the chronicle intersection uh, is not accessible here, but it's the same for HC1. What is the reason why uh, HP1 is so much uh, uh, is more emissive than the than the old systems and here is when the uh, excitonic nature of this interaction come to play a role essentially what we have is like uh, when you move to a to the hp series um the proton transfer is more effective uh, if we think about the system when you have hc1 in the case of hc1 you saw that we have a competition between relaxation in the enol and the keto form. And that was related to the similar uh, stabilities of both forms. Essentially, for the case of HC1, you can have a competition between the two possible pathways. What happens, some of the, of the, uh, of the molecules will stay in the enol form. And what happens in the enol form? In the enol form, you can, say, you can see that you may have some excitonic character of the, excite, of the excitation. When that happens, you need to consider the competition between electric Electron transport and um, uh, 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 the, the local excitation. And this is essentially the reason why we have a smaller quantum yields in the case of the HC, HC system with respect to HP1. Essentially, because, uh, because of the competition with the stabilization in ENO, uh, you will see that this competition, uh, in this case, you need to uh, analyze uh, how different is. I mean, how com how electron transport competes, or how exciton transport competes with a uh, relaxation of where the reorganization in the enol form. When you compare the exciton couplings and the uh, reorganization energies of these AC systems, you will see that they are more or less in the same order, or they are. Uh, in terms of the barriers that you have, they are uh, more or less in the order that uh, uh, electron transport is possible. While in the case of HP, so for this case, we have some competition of localization versus the localization of the excitation. While in the case of HP1 and HC5, we have like the proton transfer is so uh, uh, stable that. Uh, the excitation is going to localize on a single molecule. And because of that, the probability of competition with electron transfer is very small. And essentially what we have is like the excitation is clearly localized. So uh, for these two systems, I mean, for these two kinds of systems, uh, the excitation is extremely localized. And consequently, you will have like the uh, 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 exciton transport won't compete with the process with these two processes what is the difference between them essentially that the, this conical intersection is not accessible while this one it is so essentially the difference between these systems uh, uh, come from a competition between localization and the localization of the interactions that we have in the condensed phase so uh, one common question here is okay uh, how does this mechanism will change if I include more molecules in my QM region? And to analyze that, we did um, uh, calculations uh, considering four molecules in the QM region. And you will see that, in general, the excitations are clearly localized either on one or two molecules. So what you will, what you will get here is like, once you have relaxation in the keto form and you have proton transfer, what you will see is like the excitation clearly localized on one of the systems. So you may have some competition with the uh, um, excitonic excitations when you are working with the um, with the Frank Condon geometry, but once you have a relaxation in the proton transfer form, the uh, excitation clearly localizes. In terms of the energy, you can see that um, the interpretation doesn't really change when you increase the number of molecules uh, um, in the in the QM region. So essentially, this kind of uh, mechanisms or analysis is quite uh, um, stable, and we think that we can rely on it a, a little bit. So uh, essentially, this is everything that I wanted to tell you about. Um,
essentially um, these are the kind of uh, 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 research that we are looking at at the moment we are uh, now focusing a little bit more on uh, systems uh, that are used for uh, 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 applications that involve triple states and uh, we are looking at systems that uh, are used for uh, OLEDs and uh, uh, room uh, temperature uh, um, uh, for fluorescence and fluorescence uh, uh, properties. So um, I would like to uh, acknowledge the members of my group. Uh, uh, Michael was my PhD, my first PhD student. He did quite a lot of work on the on the uh, excited state proton transfer system. Miguel was my second PhD student. He did a lot of work of the, on the programming of, uh, of Romash. He also worked on the on this excited state proton transfer system. And Liliana uh, was working for, uh, with us for a couple of uh, for a couple of years, and she made uh, all the calculations uh, related to the. Uh, propeller systems and all, all, also other uh, things that we haven't published yet and hopefully we are going to publish in the next few months. So we we'll also want to acknowledge other members of my groups who are currently or uh, in the past work on, on, on this kind of projects, like Amir, Warda, Matt and Federico and Alston, who is one of my collaborators in physics uh, at QNUL and we are uh, currently working on some uh, methods to improve the description of a uh, uh, electrostatic interactions in this kind of uh, embedding techniques. I would like to thank you all for your attention and also to all the funding bodies that have supported our research in the last few years. So I'm very, I'll, I'll, I'll be very happy to answer your questions and thank you very much for uh, paying attention to my talk. Thank you very much, Hakka. Thank you. It was a very nice talk. Thank you. New word for for me at least because we are always working with uh, vacuum or water and some things like that, and you came to us with crystals. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank so, you. Thank you for for inviting me. So it's open for questions, please. Just raise your hand. Raquel, maybe maybe I, uh, I will start with oh, I yes. saw Sebastian there. Sorry, Sebastian. <laughs> uh, yeah, just go ahead, Carlos. Okay, uh, very interesting talk. Thank you for uh, thank for you. A very nice presentation. Uh, it, there is a lot of uh, of uh, similarities that I can see between a condensed uh, phase. Uh, quantum chemistry that you're doing and studying the interaction in in DNA polymers, uh, which of course are in solution. But if you think of them more uh, generally, there are a periodic uh, uh -huh. a, 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 um, a system, and uh, so I wonder if if this type of uh, of calculations that you're doing that you're doing can be applied to study uh, both electron transfer uh, or charge transfer in DNA, which are often coupled to to proton transfer uh, with the base pair. Have you considered um, applying your, your your techniques to to this problem of? We haven't we have we have we haven't think about this specific problem, but in principle it's possible to apply this kind of methods to do that. The main problem here is the boundaries, you know. I mean, like with any QM, uh, QM MMM methods, but uh, the boundaries between one kind of description and the other. I mean, in the case of molecular crystals, it's quite straightforward because you have like a molecule and you we normally cut the 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 cluster, I mean the QM region and the uh, QM prime you know, just using different molecules, you know. I mean, it's a little bit more difficult when you have like a covalent bonded system because you have to break bonds, but it's possible to do it as well. I mean, using similar methods that are normally used in QMM uh, techniques. And of course, I mean, you can, I mean, I think it could be indeed very interesting because you can consider this, the effect of this polymeric periodic system in a way on the central region. I mean, I think that's something that it can be done definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm personally interested in in the effect of uh, columbic interactions and, and the ions. Uh, you know, often the communities uh, do not include the counter ions and and how the 
the the charges, uh, you know, the the counter ions play a role in the in in the photochemistry of, yeah. of the DNA. Uh, and of course, DNA has been studied in the solid phase and is used in, in, in solid phase for uh, for different biotechnological applications. So th there may be an interest there where uh, the kind of, of 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 techniques that you're developing could be could could play an important role in understanding. That's that's uh, very that's a very good. I've never I've never thought about it. I think maybe something. I, I may ask you a few questions later. I mean, I think it's something very interesting to look at in it. Yeah, definitely. I think so. Yeah. We are mainly we are mainly looking at boring solid state systems now because you know I mean for me. Uh, because of my background, I think solid state, I mean, it's a little bit easier than biological systems because there, there is a lot of information from the biological systems that are not 100% aware of. So, I mean, looking at crystals and this is a bit, but it's more boring. I mean, it's boring as well. So, I mean, <laughs> no, yeah. It's, yeah. it's actually very interesting and very <laughs> applicable to, as you said, OLEDs and, and, and solid state uh, uh, photonics material. But also, uh, yeah, uh, of course, I'm biased uh, about DNA. But DNA is also used in biotechnology and, and for photonics material. There are a lot of fabrication which I seen the photochemical understanding is 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 underdeveloped, and and I see potential for for the techniques that you're developing to be used there. And I can share some papers with you later on. So yeah, that's that, that could be great. That could be great. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sebastian, go ahead. Yeah. So thanks a lot, Rachel, for this very nice talk. It was, Thank was you. really cool to, to see all that. And while you were talking, I was actually writing down a couple of questions. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, you answered all of them already. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, regarding one of the last points, I'm not completely satisfied yet. So. Um, is it really true in like every molecular crystal that all these excitations will be localized or is there some general knowledge about this how does this work it's, it's quite it's quite common i mean in general uh, for the you know uh, in general the transport in a molecular crystal is it happens by a kind of random hopping and that's because and, and that's because excitations are clearly localized in most, most cases. I mean, of course, I cannot tell you that happens in 100% of the molecular crystals. I mean, they may, there may be cases where you have like a band structure that you can clearly define and where you have like the excitation, like, you know, uh, uh, the localizing the whole crystal. But in general, you will find that for many cases, uh, you will have like the uh, excitations are clearly localized now the way of checking that is relatively easy because what you can do is like you can always try to do a calculation of the dimers you just go to the solid you just extract the dimers from the solid and uh, you calculate the exciton couplings and you compare the exciton couplings uh, with the uh, uh, reorganization energies. So uh, in the end, you have competition there. Okay, what's going to stabilize your system more? The localizing the excitation or localizing the excitation? Uh, if you if you look at the if you compare the exciton couplings or the reorganization energies, that gives you an idea of where the excitation is going to be localized or is going to be spread. So in most of the cases, you will get like it's gonna be clearly localized. Okay, so yeah what, what i learned or what, what it sounds to me like is that in the beginning during the excitation process you have some kind of delocalization but then it quickly localizes due to yeah random motion and so on yeah. exactly exactly that, that, and this is this, is this is this is more i mean if you have proton transfer it's even more obvious because proton transfer i mean to happen effectively you need to concentrate like the energy in one monomer so yeah. that's going to localize the excitation even more mm. cool 
Thanks. And then, yeah, my, my second, my backup question was uh, whether you could elaborate a bit more on the surface hopping studies, because, yeah, obviously I'm always interested in surface hopping. Yes. <laughs> we did, I mean, we just did like traditional surface hopping simulations there. I mean, uh, I did, I, 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 I don't remember exactly how many trajectories we did. I think that we did like 50 trajectories or something like that. It was not like a lot of trajectories. And in this case, we use ADC2. So mm -hmm. uh, we did uh, we did check the, the potential energy surfaces with different le level of theory, and we did it with CC2 at the time. Then with I mean, as as I mentioned at some point, these systems we have really, I think that we have calculated then all of with anything that we can that we can use. So I can tell you that more or less how how the methods behave. So uh, in the uh, for these systems we did the potential area surfaces with CC2 at the beginning, and then we did the uh, uh, non-adiabatic uh, dynamic simulations with uh, with ADC2. There is a problem with ADC2 there, and the thing is like the MP2 ground state is not very well described. So uh, in some cases you may have like the system hops earlier than uh, it should because. Uh, is, uh, when I mean, you can clearly see when you compare like the energies of the of the minima that they are well described. But uh, when you look at the at the at the crossings, the crossings with ADC two, they seem to be like I mean happening earlier than they should. If you will using like a uh, CAS CF or even with uh, with CC two, so uh, maybe it's not like the you know, if you want to really analyze the uh, crossings to the ground state, maybe it's not the best method. But in yeah. terms of the in terms of the initial relaxation, and in that case, what it was really helpful was to look at the distribution of the of the of the trajectories uh, uh, either on the enol or the keto form. That part of the potential energy surface is well, I mean, very well described by DC two. So, I mean, in principle, we don't have uh, significant concerns about it but yes the truth is like the crossings with the with the ground state maybe it happens too too early you know yeah. so you're like forcing the hop when the gap is small enough yes yeah. yes like yes, everybody yes. yeah and yes, like... it, it, this is somehow overlap based couplings i guess yes 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 okay. yes see good thanks good thanks a lot no problem <laughs> no, thank you <laughs> Raquel, if I may, may uh, piggyback on, on, on Sebastian's uh, uh, questions, uh, often uh, conical intersection and the energies barriers are, are, are for what I understand, uh, it highly dependent on the uh, electron correlation, the dynamic and static uh, correlation. So, so how this affect in the in the condensed phase in this material? How including uh, uh, electron correlation effects affect the relative energies and, and the access to these conical intersections. Yeah, if it, of course it depends on, a lot of on the on the particular system. I mean, for these proton transfer systems, we've done we've done a uh, CAS CF and with with it a uh, MP two as well. And in fact, we couldn't optimize the conicals with a uh, uh, CAS PT two because it was too much. I mean, in the solid. But uh, we kind of because you know when you look for example at, at the at the conicals and you compare the the gaps that you get with uh, caspt two they are a little bit large so we try to reduce the gaps manually and uh, that's also possible and you can I mean you can try to uh, you can try to optimize the I mean the best choice of course could be that we could you could do everything with uh, with pt two but it's not possible always and you know i mean in this instance we also have like i mean not only the okay the description of the intermolecular interactions and so you also have all the point charges so you have like a quite a lot of things to take into account I but see. i mean we i mean it it also it also affects the results you know i mean we try always to be careful and try to check uh, different methods but yes we always have that problem that it may be a uh, problematic in a way to I mean, if you don't include all the electron correlation that you need, you may be like 
not be able to describe uh, properly the, the 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 photochemistry. In the case of the propeller shape, shape systems, for example, you don't get anything. Uh, properly if you do TDFT, for example. I mean, that study was completely done with CASA-CF and cas 2 You don't get anything with, uh, I mean, you don't get anything reasonable with DFT so, uh, or TDFT. So it, it depends on the system. In the case of proton transfer, the proton transfer systems, you can get some reasonable results with TDFT as well and with CC2 and all of it. But for the propeller shape, I mean, you really need to do a uh, CASA CF. And I think that is because, I mean, the, the ground state is quite a uh, multi-configurational there as well. So uh, you, you, re you, you really need to uh, look at the particular system, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you rely mostly on experimental results to, to, to know when you need to include? Uh, in the, you know, I mean, uh, we've been trying, I mean, for this, uh, for this kind of projects, as, as, as we've been trying to uh, analyze, um, you know, like the factors that are important for this kind of system, we've been trying most of the case in the cases to explain things that the experimentalists have observed, you know. So we always try to be very careful and try to reproduce well, like the emission energies, the absorption energies, and try to have some a, a, a reassurance that we are describing different parts of the potential energy surfaces properly. Of course, I mean, it's very difficult to know if the conicals are in the right, in the right position, you know. So it's excited taste, you know, I mean, it's challenging, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, no, I, I was wondering if uh, if the if the theory have been developed to the point that you can predict uh, uh, photochemical behavior before experiments are are done, or if at this stage is mostly explaining the experimental results with the I theory. Think, I think I think of course you can always try to predict, but I think that we are more at the level that uh, we are trying to explain. Mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. moment you know yeah which is is quite challenging anyway so thank yes you. <laughs> i appreciate that thanks <laughs> thank you there is another question for you Raquel lucas yes thank you professor Raquel. it was a very nice summer thank you and, uh i don't know if i understand to do well, how the, the, the calculation is made. Uh, the, my question is, if I understood well, you have to separate your system in three parts, and one is the QM part, mm -hmm. another part is the MM part, or a semi-empirical. Uh, it's if, not, yeah, it's not MM. We, we normal, normally do QM, QM. But yes, it could be, it could be MM, as, MM as well. I mean, there oh, is okay. nothing. Yeah, it could be MM as well. Yeah. Okay. So you have to, for example, optimize the structures or, well, make all the calculations on this part in the QM part, for example, a CASA CF. And so you have to make this in the, the QM part as if we would make this calculation in a gas phase, for example. We do no. I mean, what we do is like we do we do embedded cal embedded calculations. So essentially, what we do is like we start. We always start with a solid state calculation. So mm -hmm. we start from the solid. We get like the uh, structure of the solid, the period structure Sorry. of the solid, okay. and we do a DFT PV, a periodic boundary condition calculation. And with that, we optimize the structure of the solid. So uh, using like a standard DFT uh, periodic boundary condition method. So once we have that, uh, we select our region. So we select a cluster in the in the in the system, and uh, in this this cluster we are going to you know we are going to choose like what is our central part that is going to be the part that is going to be excited. Then you have like this buffer region that uh, is around the central part and it's going to uh, the charges of that part are going to stay like fixed and then we also have like this cell region where we let the charges change to uh, 
reproduce the electrostatic potential of the of the rest of the system now this is let's say for the description of the electrostatic part this is involved in the uh, just one of the calculations that we have and if you want if you want i can show you the 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 slide so it's maybe it's more clear for you let me um yeah let me see what i did with my presentation i think i no i didn't i didn't close it so yes if i share this um and you look at this if you look at this here essentially you use that in this step you know, our model involves three calculations, you know. Mm -hmm. And what I tell you is just to define this part here. So here we have, okay, we have, okay, we define our cluster, the whole cluster that is going to be this here. Okay. And uh, we define our cluster. And uh, once we define our cluster and we have like uh, this set of charges that I, sent, I, I told you the ones in the, a buffer region are not going to change and not showing the buffer region because the buffer region for example doesn't have anything to do with the uh, qm prima region they can be different okay. indeed so uh, you have uh, the, these three set of charges and they are used to do an embedded qm calculation okay, okay. so this is okay. for this uh, step here and on the other side you do this two calculations in this calculation this is the calculation that is done at the lowest level you consider your cluster the one that you define at the beginning and you calculate all of this in the ground state in most cases we do that with a semi-empirical method but you can do it essentially with any method it could be mmn it could be uh, it could be also a hard tree fog for example it could be mm -hmm. another ab initio method or an or a dft method and uh, just to uh, uh, you know, get rid of the electrostatic part of the uh, of this description. So we only keep the uh, interactions that are beyond the electrostatic interactions, because the electrostatic part related to the, to the excitation are already described in this first calculation here. So to do that, we do another embedded calculation where we use now the cluster that we define. We have our central molecule. And we do a, a calculation using the same level of theory that you use here, but you use a, you use a, you only calculate the same current region that you have in this part, and you mm -hmm. just use the point charges that you have in the cluster in a way that when you do this subtraction, you are getting rid of the electros. A, you, the a term that you obtain is everything but the Coulombic part. So because uh, uh, after this difference here what you get is this person to change any other term here so okay. in this part you describe all the columbic part uh, that is in the end the excited state and in this part that is in the ground state you describe this person to change and the rest of the interactions uh, this part here has the problem that is described in the ground state so uh, maybe there are some effects that you are not taking into account but this is quite common in uh, for many of the methods that are based on this kind of uh, scheme so it's something that is dif difficult to correct we are trying to work in this direction that now but it's it's a little it's a little bit difficult so it's that's essentially did that answer your question yes 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 uh, that's that's it thank you no problem you're welcome any other question well I have a curiosity. So how long do you propagate your trajectories? Uh, those trajectories, I think I've, uh, we've run them. Let me tell you, because I, I don't remember, because this, uh, this, these calculations were done long time ago. I mean, we propagate those for, I think, like around 250 femtoseconds. Yes, it was oh. like 250 femtoseconds, yes. It's not so long. I mean, no, it's not so long. But as I mentioned at the at the beginning, you know, I mean, uh, in this case, we were looking at maybe uh, mainly at the initial steps of the relaxation, you know, to see like where the potential energy surfaces were uh, taking the system, you know. So it's more to see like the initial steps. I mean, the relaxation mm -hmm. uh, away from the Frank condom. Uh, as I 
as I, I mentioned to uh, 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 to Sebastian before, I mean, uh, you know, even if we, I mean, we cannot rely too much on the times that we get at the at the end of the of the dynamics because the crossing was a little bit earlier than than it should happen. So, so it's more like qualitative description of the of the mm -hmm. dynamics that we get from here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question, comment? No? So I thank you ag again, Raquel. And congratulations for your very nice work. Thank you, and thank you. <laughs> thank you for pioneer. your attention. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are a kind of pioneer in this kind of calculation. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I mean, uh, we are trying. I mean, this. I mean, this is based on, you know, there there are many people who've used this kind of methods in the past, but not for excited states. I have to say, yes. mainly for mainly for uh, describing uh, um, doping and also to describe defects in solids. Mm -hmm. So uh, they are not that common in 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 excited states, but but hopefully more people will start using them. So. That's good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I hope you will be with us in the next seminars. Thank you. Yeah. Send me, send me, right. send me, send me, send me the, yes. the invitations. I haven't, I yes. haven't, I, I'm not in the list, so I haven't, I haven't got any, any, any one before. Okay. I will send it to you. Thank good. you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much. Welcome. Bye bye. Thank Have you. Nice, bye bye. Have Thank a you. Nice weekend. You too. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Have a nice week. Bye bye. Everybody. Everybody. bye, -bye. You Thank soon. you everybody. Bye bye. <laughs> See you. Sebastian, Carlos, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.